Hello, my name is Michael Truero, and I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Institute for Human Neuroscience at Boys Town National Research Hospital. I'd like to thank DMCN for allowing me the opportunity to post this video podcast over our recent work on the microstructural changes within the spinal cord of adults with cerebral palsy. Previous work has demonstrated that in response to an insult to the developing brain, there are a series of neuroplastic changes that occur both within the brain and within the spinal cord. Despite this knowledge, the specific microstructural changes that may occur in the spinal cord, as well as how these may be contributing to sensory motor deficits seen within this population, remains unknown. To this end, we recruited a total of 13 adults with spastic bilateral cerebral palsy, as well as a cohort of 16 healthy adult controls to take part in a neuroimaging study. Each of these individuals underwent a series of MRI scans. Shown in panel A on the left side of the screen is an image of the upper or the cervical thoracic spinal cord in a representative subject with cerebral palsy. Utilizing the spinal cord toolbox, we were able to segment the gray matter as well as the white matter within the upper spinal cord. This is shown in panel B in which gray matter is depicted in yellow and white matter is depicted in light blue. We were then able to calculate the total cross-sectional area of the spinal cord, as well as the cross-sectional area of both the gray and the white matter. In doing so, we found that the total cross-sectional area of the spinal cord, as well as the cross-sectional area of both the gray and the white matter, were all significantly reduced in the adults with cerebral palsy. These individuals also underwent diffusion-weighted imaging, an example of which is shown on the left side of the screen in panel A. And from this, we could extract fractional anisotropy, which is generally a measure of the integrity of white matter tracts. We were also able to look at magnetization transfer imaging. And from this, we were able to extract the magnetization transfer ratio, which has been a outcome measure that has been previously associated with alterations in both gray and white matter. While we didn't find any differences in the DWI outcome measures, we did find that the magnetization transfer ratio was significantly reduced in the adults with cerebral palsy in comparison to the healthy adult controls. On top of this, the individuals that had more gray matter within their spinal cords also tended to have higher magnetization transfer ratios. Finally, and importantly, several of the outcome measures from our spinal cord data were significantly associated with hand functioning as measured by the box and blocks test. Individuals that had higher total cross-sectional area as well as a higher gray matter cross-sectional area also tended to perform better on this test indicating that these changes within the spinal cord may actually be contributing to some of the sensory motor deficits that are seen within this population. In conclusion, we've demonstrated the viability of imaging the spinal cord in individuals with cerebral palsy. We've also demonstrated specific microstructural changes that are occurring at the level of the spinal cord as a result of the insult to the developing brain. Ultimately, these changes may be contributing to some of the sensory motor deficits that are seen within this population. And future studies can expand on this by identifying other ways in which the spinal cord may be impacting the different deficits that are seen. Thank you for listening and feel free to contact me with any questions.